Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you today. Uh, maybe a little bit too excited. Paul, I'm not sure you should have let me on camera because, well, I mean, you know I have the face for the movies, but um, in seriousness, I am happy to be here and I am so happy to be with all of you today. And I hope that by the end of today's message, you understand um, where that joy is coming from. And before we get started, I just wanted to wish a happy birthday to Erin Wartman, an incredible young woman. And Erin, I am just so happy that you're in my life and in our life at peace. And I love your energy and you rock. So with that, I'm going to jump in today's uh, lesson, which comes from the Gospel of John. It begins at chapter 4, verse 5. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to a city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty, but those who drink of water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me that water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. 
she said to the people, Come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that you may not do, that you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. So it's kind of strange to be talking to you all this way because even though I'm used to technology, I've used a webcam before. I make calls at work through Zoom to, to meetings. Um, it just really isn't the same. I miss seeing all of your faces most of them are very beautiful. And I miss hearing you laugh at my corny jokes. I'm not with you physically, and for me that is a loss. Worship is something that we do together. And as good as it is to be with you this morning, it just isn't the same. We are practicing what the experts are calling social distancing. We are choosing to physically isolate ourselves from each other so that we can protect everyone more effectively. This is necessary because of everything we know about the coronavirus. If you carry the virus, it can be spread to anyone within six feet of you. I just read that it could be alive on plastic or metal for nine days. That's why the hand washing is so important. Anything you touch might have the virus. And we know that infected people do not show symptoms for two to five days, possibly even a week. So to put this all into perspective, somebody that you saw at church a week ago could have coughed and touched the door handle. Somebody else throughout the week may have touched that same handle and picked up the virus. And even though all this happened a week ago or a few days ago, we wouldn't know it yet. Fortunately, at the current time, this scenario is unlikely. But each day that passes, it becomes clear that um, the odds are getting worse. None of this is to scare you. What we've learned from other countries is that all of this is manageable. Countries like Taiwan have done an incredible job of preventing the illness from spreading among their people. So there's nothing to fear, but we do have to respect this virus, which is why we're meeting like this this morning. So what on earth does a pandemic have to do with a woman standing by a well? On the surf surface of the, of the story, you can tell there's really not much. 
but it turns out that today's reading is incredibly timely. Because John's story isn't about giving a thirsty person water. John didn't just ask some random person for a drink. Jesus asked a very particular and very unlikely person for water. John doesn't tell us the woman's name, but he does give us a few details about her. She was on her fifth husband, she was a, and she was a Samaritan. So, of course, John is making a point here. For John's audience, this woman was about as questionable of a character as a human being can be. First, most obviously, she was a woman. And as we know in Jesus' time in our own, um, that, can, that can be seen as a negative. And she was a Samaritan, a close cousin but bitter rival to the Jews that Jesus ministered to. And finally, there were those five husbands. Now, we don't know much about her life, and I would love to spend some time in the future unpacking what, what those five husbands might mean for a feminist interpretation of this gospel reading. But um, today, I think it's enough to say that, that she, she had a history. So the fact that Jesus even spoke to her was scandalous. We see that in today's gospel reading. The disciples were astonished. They were speechless. But more astonishing, Jesus not only spoke to her, he invited her to believe and offered her the gift of eternal life. As John tells us, the Jews did not share things in common with the Samaritans. The Samaritans and Jews were geographical neighbors, but they didn't get along. They were also descendants of the same people. We hear this in John's Gospel. John reminds us that Jacob dug the well where this conversation took place. This is the same Jacob of the book of Genesis. This well is old and deep. The water has quenched the thirst of the people in this area for a long time. And now for John's audience, it is a well that, lie, that lies beyond the enemy line. The Samaritans and the Jews worshiped the same God, but they had different traditions and beliefs. An especially important point of disagreement was where the people should worship God. Disagreement was so important that John talks about it in the story. The woman at the well tells Jesus, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. This is a scandalous moment. It is scandalous because Jesus, of who Jesus is talking to, but is scandalous for another reason. Not only is he talking to somebody he should be avoiding, he is inviting an enemy to worship with him. This is a story about reconciliation and healing. It is about reaching across divides to bring people together. And the story itself is a claim that we are called by God to worship together, all people throughout the world. Today, we at PCCC worship together in places very different from our home, from our mountain. Our experience, though admittedly minor by comparison, is an experience that shapes the scriptures and shapes our faith, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. Our faith tradition is one that always searches to find a voice for worship. When the world around us doesn't make sense and makes worship seem impossible, the exodus through the wilderness 
the destruction of the temple, the crucifixion of Jesus. Our faith is built on stories of exile, diaspora, and isolation. Our ancestors are no strangers to their own forms of what we might call social distancing, though those forms were imposed by the powers of the day. But through it all, God was with them, and God is with us. And so while our worship this morning is not ideal, I'm so grateful to be with you and part of this community. I'm grateful that you will be praying with me and loving God with all of your hearts. And while we should respect the coronavirus, we don't have to be afraid. The virus won't have the final word. God will. And so, as you may have been able to tell at the beginning of this video, I'm a little bit excited, and that might seem kind of strange. This isn't our idea of church, but that's okay. Because something beautiful is happening. Yesterday I watched Pastor Paul on Facebook Live, and I could see that there were 11 of you with me. Today we gather, and it gives me joy knowing, knowing that despite the fact that we're separated by space, we are sharing this moment. For a long time, the church, both big church and our church, our peace congregation, have talked about what social media and technology means for our worship life. But I think our ideas of and our ideals for what church should be have made that imagining difficult. Now we are forced to rely on social media. We can begin to imagine new ways of being together. We can begin to understand how we can make our worship more accessible to the people with physical disabilities or mental illness. People for whom going to church on Sunday morning may be difficult or even dangerous. We can think about all the things we take for granted in the ways we can worship God more fully together. And most importantly today, we can find comfort and joy with each other in God's word, even while practicing social distancing. Our worship life isn't dead, it's just being transformed. Or maybe I should say, hallelujah, it's being transformed. So as I conclude, I want to recommend you all go to Google or YouTube and search for videos of the Italians singing in quarantine. If this goes on long enough, I'll get better and we'll be able to edit some cool videos and I will just, you know, give this kind of video to you. But for now, I'm going to have to ask you to, to do the legwork. But I saw these videos this, the last couple of days. Um, and they're just such a powerful witness to what it means for me to be a Christian and um, I think what the meaning of today's gospel story is. As Christians, we accept death and sin as a reality that separates us. And today we accept the coronavirus as a re reality that separates us. We know that there are times when they will be physically or emotionally isolated from each other, but we are not alone. And that separation that we feel, whether from each other or from God, that separation is not nearly as strong as the love of God. And so when we join our voices together, and when we make beautiful music, when we find our joy in the midst of sorrow and fear, we come together and we heal. We bridge the distance and isolation. We worship together and know God's love.
and we share that healing and love with everyone who can hear us. We heard it today in John's Gospel. We heard that it isn't in the temple where we worship God, but in God's Spirit. And we are all in God's Spirit today, and with one another in love. And with that, I am truly blessed. Thank you.